All right. So good afternoon, everyone. And hopefully you're enjoying Dev our first DevNet Create. Um, my name is Nermin Esmail, and I'll be the moderator for this afternoon's panel. Uh, I worked in Cisco for many years on traditional back-end services and embedded systems. Three years ago, I started to embark on the transformation into cloud and cloud-native application development, and I am enjoying every single bit of it. So the industry has been using this very interesting analogy to talk about this transformation, which is the pets versus cattle. Pets, which we all love and individually care for, sometimes at a very high cost, represent the model where services were developed typically in pairs. Each instance of this pair will have its own individual identity and status and state. And we keep, as developers, we keep maintaining these individual identities and state and, 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 and manage them. On the other hand, there is the cattle model, which is the new model, where services are clustered uh, to leverage automation and to design high availability and failure recovery inherently within that cluster. Um, so today, our panel is going to talk about this transformation from pets into cattle. Uh, and uh, I will start by asking Matt to introduce himself. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Hi, I'm Matt Johnson. Um, I work for Cisco, but I'm in uh, a slightly weird position in which most of the things I work, in fact, all the things I work on are open source CNCF based projects. I can't remember the last time I actually touched a, a, a Cisco sold project. So I'm kind of here representing the CNCF uh, rather than Cisco. Thank you, Matt. Mendy? Hi, I'm Mandy Whaley. I'm part of our DevNet team. And on this panel, I'm here representing, like I mentioned in my keynote this morning, the voice of the developer. So I, I speak for the devs. I'm here representing like the application developer perspective. Thanks, Mandy. Steven? Uh, hi, uh, I'm Steven Day. I work for Docker. Uh, I work on the uh, a project called ContainerD, which is um, kind of the low-level runtime of Docker, uh, as well as like our image distribution models, so the registry, uh, as well as our cluster orchestration system uh, known as SwarmKit. Um, and uh, I'm a maintainer on Docker and work on container -y things. So. Excellent. Nice having you, Stephen. So, Arpit? All right, so Arpit Joshpura. I head up an open source networking at the Linux Foundation. Been in the networking space for 30 years, right? Engineering all the way in. Worked for pretty much all the networking companies except Cisco. <laughs> so always competed with you guys, or <laughs> half of you guys. We can change that. Uh, we well, I'm guys. here, <laughs> <laughs> but um, excited to be here. And um, you know, I'm representing obviously you know networking, open source networking, in this new era of uh, you know application development. Thank you, Arpit, and we always welcome competition. <laughs> <laughs> Mayumi? <laughs> Hi, I'm Mayumi, Mayumi Hiramatsu. Uh, I work at Cisco as well, and I run product operations. And what I do is essentially help a lot of the products at Cisco that are moving to the cloud or IoT. My background is 100% DevOps, so um, I'm the one that makes sure that these guys write their code right. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> that's great. It's good. <laughs> Thank you, Mayumi. OK, so uh, I'll start with you, Matt. So, we almost have to live in a cave in order not to hear the words microservices, containers, cloud native applications. But what do these terms really mean? And how do they help into this transformation from pets to, into cattle? I mean, I think that's a good question. I think that obviously we know that all these terms are related to this transformation. But I think I don't think it's right to say that these terms are like, oh, you need all these terms in order to do this transformation journey. I think it's actually the opposite way around, where these terms came about to give things we started realizing we needed to do, um, names that people could easily search and people could easily learn. And it's not about the names of the technologies or the, the business processes you put there. It's about the business outcome. So what do you want? You want more stable, more scalable, faster deployments that cost you less in downtime, less in messing around with you know, bespoke snowflakes and, and building your servers one by one. And how do you do that? Well, you start looking at how do I do quicker deployments? And that leads on to, OK, um, to do quicker deployments, I need to be sure of the thing I'm deploying is going to be successful. So then I need to start carving up my application to make it easier and, and to make sure that 
I can, I can do that successfully. And so then you start carving things up and you start looking at the problems you have when you carve your application up, like, okay, where do I store state? How do these pieces talk to each other? And at this point, you're already then looking at, okay, so this is like a 12-factor app and these are the things I need to do for that to work properly. And, and at that point, you've kind of got to microservices. And you know, during that, during that kind of flow to microservices, you'll have been like, well, how do I deploy this quickly? And you'll have got to containers. So I think that these are just terms we've given to the journey that the industry's taken and the lesson learned from, you know, how do we enable kind of these modern kind of business practices? Excellent. Stephen. Uh, well, I'll start, start with definitions. I mean, so a microservice is a way to build your application. It's a, it's, it's a way it's organized. And um, as, as far as uh, like pets versus cattle goes, you, you take a, um, uh, what you really re what we do with microservices is we're able to uh, break up these large monoliths and, and turn them into little little tiny pieces. Now our relationship with containers is interesting because um, when you when you try to deploy microservices and in, in um, they can have a lot of dependencies. They can be a large Java application or uh, a large Python application or large Ruby application with with a that, that's very expensive to to build and deploy with. Uh, uh, like I mean, think of like Ruby gems. It takes forever to run on certain machines. Um, but containers allow us to actually uh, ship those dependencies with them. So it really enables these 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 architectures. So we so we we've, we've almost been seeing microservices for a while now. But um, we, along with the tool of containers, such that we can ship all of these dependencies together, um, we're able to much uh, much easily uh, organize our. Uh, applications in different ways, and it, and, and mi microservices are one aspect to it. But now, like like since you can you can basically re relocate your workload, it, it allows you to um, effectively, you know, ra rather than rather than saying, well, I need to do it this way because all of my dependencies that are there, and I deployed it in this giant monolith, I can say, well, I'm going to slice my application like this, and microservices are are one way to do that, and so we can, um, and you know, containers are. I'll say it again, containers are the tool to make that actually happen. All right. I added some color on the pet definition also. Just yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, so I think uh, for those of you who may have read it, right, Randy Bias wrote this blog on Linux.com in, in, in 2016, right, where he actually said, you know, I put an app and I put it on a server, it's a database connected, it goes down, the whole thing is out. You put it on a VM, it's still on a server, the, the server goes down, it's out. You put it in one data center, the data center goes out, it's out, right? So the original intent of this was really, how do I make apps, you know, along with what we said on faster, quicker, cheaper, et cetera, but also highly available, right? Which is the, in, in, you know, the real intent of this cat and paddle. I mean, you shoot a server, and this is the web scale uh, thought process, right? Which is, you know, there is no need for me to know what server. You can take a server out, apps just function as is. Right? Yeah. So that's, that's the, the cattle part of it versus there's a specific pet, just, just definitions. Yeah. Right. And if I can add to that. Yep, you please go ahead. Yep. <laughs> go ahead. Because I, I was at Microsoft when we were building um, tens of thousands of servers. And the only way to actually scale was to automate the heck out of everything we did. But then we quickly realized that if we automate and did all this you know, automated failover and you know, detection and predictive analysis and all these cool stuff, the apps will fail if it assumes that that particular hardware is going to be there, that particular VIP is going to be there, you know, very specific. And so it really morphed, I think, into, OK, well, back in the days, the app was monolithic and the systems were monolithic. Remember the E10K guys for the, for the people mm -hmm. who might be my age? And so, you know, eBay broke it, if you guys remember. It just couldn't handle a load anymore and realized that we have to do distributed compute, but in order for that to happen, it actually required the app to also be resilient. And then you start taking <coughs> cloud compute where you just automate the heck out of all the recoveries. You know, you need the apps to actually be resilient for that too. So I think it's, it's been a really interesting evolution in that. And um, you know, now the ecosystem supports it, right? Because we've got things like CI, CD and capabilities to actually manage it, um, better inventory management as well, so that it no longer requires that much um, human interaction to manage a huge workload. Yeah. So as a developer, at the end of the day, what I care about is delivering business services that would give business value. 
So what is the impact that you have seen, Mayumi, on the uh, business services with this new model of development? Yeah, so definitely a huge difference. Um, so I support, for example, at Cisco, I support the IoT, the collaboration, security, video services, all the ones that are essentially moving really fast to the cloud and IoT. And what you'll realize is that big difference between those who are still, you know, monolith, big, chunky, millions of lines of code guys just can't move fast enough, right? Versus folks who actually are writing cloud native containers and able to actually move, not only can they go faster, but the reliability is better. Excellent. Do you still see um, the legacy application? Because sometimes it's very hard to move everything towards that new uh, model. So do you still see that? Do you think that people should just go ahead and transform everything? What's your advice on that? You know, absolutely. So. I think uh, we're starting to see more and more this dream that everything would be cloud native, but not quite, <laughs> <laughs> especially for our enterprises and companies that's been around for a while. Um, when you start looking at internal systems, applications that they've written in the past, it's really hard to you know, shift over and rewrite, right? We all know it's really difficult to do. Um, so you gotta have to pick and choose whether it's your apps that are new or the ones that you know you really have to rewrite. Then you have all this middle stuff. So one of the things I think the hardest is how do you manage this hybrid world? And um, it's, it's a combination. It's, it's bimodal in that you've got the old app and the new app and you're trying to figure out how do I make this work in a very, um, uh, in a way that they can move at the, the right speed, which is where you know, containers are really awesome too because you're no longer tied and oh my gosh, there's massive tests that we used to do every time we do a deployment of one side but the other one's not ready and those like month end huge test cycles that we used to run, you can actually de decouple them and make sure that you can move at a different speed as long as you have the right you know, handshake capabilities there. Um, so that's one. The other thing is, I think that the cloud infrastructure has really morphed over the last five, 10 years, and hopefully you guys would agree. Back when I started doing this, you only had data centers. You had to run it yourself. Now you all probably, many of you guys, use AWS and Azure and other options that are out there, as well as potentially your own cloud, because guess what? You probably still have stuff that runs in your data center, if, especially if you've been around for a while. So it's a very mix and match type of mode that it's, it does require a little bit more architectural thinking to realize where do I want to have my workload, um, especially for IoT, where I think there were some IoT sessions today. You got to have some fog compute because you just can't have all that data. You can only go so much in terms of mm -hmm. the pipeline, the speed, um, and the cost <laughs> of schlepping that data everywhere, right? So if you start thinking about that, it really does take a little discipline in terms of where and how to do the compute because you do have options and then making sure that you're taking the best out of those different type of options that you have. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you guys have some concepts around it that I'd love to hear. Well, I mean, it, I mean back to your point about um, uh, you know, people, should they, should they be jumping out and doing microservices right away? Um, and I think this is an area where um, a lot of people kind of panic. It's like, what, what do I do? How do I, how do I get into this container thingies? And how do I get into microservices? But um, ultimately, the pet versus, if we look at, the, you know, transitioning from pet, pets versus cattle, it's not a, a stepping, it's not a, not a stair step. It's this, you want to build this ramp to where you say, okay, this is, this is the piece of my application that by going to microservices and using containers and using um, and, and using the cloud and, and getting that application in there, this is the area that I'm going to get my business value. And then this other area, we can wait till later until we can re-architect it. And I think, I think making that decision for yourself is, is, is daunting, but I think it's important and, and not to take on too much. You, wanna, you don't want to suffer from analysis paralysis, like where do I slice this application? Where's the right piece? You want to pick something new and, and, and just grab a part of it and say, okay, well, this little tiny slice right here will let, let us learn, and then you can iterate and develop your own best practices. If you listen to people on the internet, they'll say all sorts of great things like, oh, just use containers and just use microservices <laughs> and just rewrite it like that. And um, But the, the true expense of that is is absolutely immense. There was a great great blog on, on that, that broke this uh, expense down of actually rewriting it in a different language. And it's like, oh, yeah, that is a terrible idea. But um, but if you if you take it in chunks and you, and you turn it into like small achievable goals, you can really make it happen. So um, this is I mean, th and this is this is this is the biggest area that that like I think people kind of get hung up on, and this is the this is the biggest questions I get. It's like, what's the best practice for X? And it's like, well, 
you know, here's the tool, here's the properties of it, what's going to work well for you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's a really interesting point because one of the things I see at, you know, dev conference and in dev forums where I am, everyone's talking about this, um, you know, how, how are we taking our monolith and breaking it into microservices? And there's lots of presentations and blogs on that. But there's also the, the pre-question of which applications are the right ones to do that. And it's not all of them. And I think that there's, initially there was a lot of euphoria around like everything is, everything is microservices, Docker, Docker, Docker. And, um, you know, and everyone going that way. And there is still um, loads of momentum and value in it. But I am starting to see some very thoughtful blogs around how do you pick from your legacy applications, which are the ones that you go after and where is it right to do that. And I think, um, for us to really make this transformation, that part of the conver conversation has to be there. From the dev perspective, like I think the developers have always wanted our services to be cattle. Like we always like it's like we don't really want to think about it. We want it to run the same in production and dev and everywhere and be highly available. And it was. Um, you know, we didn't want to like feed and care for a server or a service. Like we were like really wanted that um, ability for a long time. And now because the business pressures are there, because we have this need to move fast, you know, all the technologies have, have come come into being and it's, and it's possible to do it. And so it's very exciting from that perspective. But it's also, um, you, it still may not be a fit for everything, right? Any architecture pattern is not a fit for all problems. Just right. on that as well, um, there was a great session um, on the CNCF yesterday in the other classroom, which we'll be able to watch on YouTube after the event, where that exact thing was brought up, you know, this idea of if anyone tells you, ooh, if, you, if it's not a microservice, you shouldn't be putting it in a Docker container, like rubbish, like lifting and shifting your monolith into a Docker container actually get, gets you into a much better position where you can start thinking about chipping a little bit off that block, the bit that adds the most business value, yeah. because then they're on the same infrastructure. You're managing one infrastructure, not two, for that given service, so the team isn't going back and forth between old and new. You know, massive value in, as you say, taking that journey a step at a time, um, because the, the point raised was your existing application in production will continue to evolve customer requirements, bugs, fixes, and potentially your rewrite will never actually catch up. So most rewrites fail because the other application doesn't just come to a stop. Mm. And you know, so you, you're just wasting money uh, in a lot of occasions with that approach. And, and one big benefit to this just lift and shift or modernizing the traditional applications um, is that you, even though you might not get microservices or whatever you were looking for out of that, it's your deployment process that's going to change. Right. And getting to that deployment process that's compatible with microservices uh, or whatever architecture you want to use um, is going to be hugely valuable to, uh, to increasing your iteration speed. Yeah. All right. So networking and analytics is really an interesting domain for lots of people. So Arpit, so uh, what is the biggest issue facing developers uh, when they look at the connectivity between their services and the de various de hybrid deployment scenarios? What is the data that can be connected from the network and how can it help the developers to develop better applications and improve business value? Yeah, that, so that, that, that could be a whole session by itself. <laughs> <laughs> um, but let me see if I can summarize it. You know, as I said, there is the infrastructure layer, which has tons of rich data, all the way from you know, ports to interfaces. You know, you, I don't need to tell you where data is coming from, including the forwarding plane ASICs, right? Every piece of information and data that exists in the network is rich. The problem is it has not been harnessed to, in, to be interpreted, right? Um, and then applications, most of the times, are abstracted from that, right? So at the Linux Foundation, at least in the open source networking, what we are doing is we are incubating and developing and actually deploying several open source projects in certain verticals, right? Not all the verticals, but like let's say in carriers, for example, service providers. Uh, we've got a project called ONAP, which is Open Network Automation Platform, um, that effectively is, you know, uh, th there's an analytics component inside which can give you tremendous insights from the entire layer, you know, between the apps all the way down. Uh, but the best part of it is it's got closed loop automation. So you can actually set up policies uh, that will react and pass that information through REST APIs into your apps, and it will actually 
let the infrastructure, the entire infrastructure, we're not talking data structure, data center here, you, the entire infrastructure uh, kind of uh, dynamically get managed and, and automated, right? So that's a very exciting project supported by almost 40% of global uh, mobile subscribers worldwide, right? So China Mobile, China Telecom, AT&T, et cetera. Um, on the enterprise side, there are projects, you know, thanks to Cisco, things like uh, Panda. Uh, we just took over... Uh, uh, SNAS IO, right? Uh, so ca which is can you give us like, like a little bit of a uh, little bit of color what, on what that? Is Panda? Yeah. Okay, so these are you know analytics, open source projects, right? To uh, hook up into big data, for example, right? And to help help foster this this mammoth amount of data, right? I mean, um, SNAS IO, for example, you know, open BMP, BGP monitoring, you know, things like that. And again, you guys should know this, right? And thanks to Dave Ward from Cisco, just wanted to put a sh shout out. He's a big supporter for- We have like lots of non-Cisco <laughs> participants as well. <laughs> and, and of course, non-Cisco, they would be familiar with the open source networking here. Um, but the good news is these uh, analytics are now tied into a layer that can be utilized in a closed loop automation, right? In the orchestration and policy layer. Now keep in mind, applications really don't care about it, as, as you said, right? But the reality is the application need to be highly available. Mm -hmm. And so you have to understand, you know, should I deploy here? Should I put this via, you know, yeah, dude, you don't need to worry about IP addresses, but you still, there is still some dependency. My vision is, you know, completely independent, right? You have the network and the closed loop automation based on analytics, right? I mean, there's an example that, uh, that uh, you know, uh, one, one flight of a GE turbo engine, right? Uh, just a simple short flight, one terabyte of data, right? Amazing information. Now that, when it gets processed and there are apps that are developed, you better know what, what the insights are. You can't just, use raw data, right? So that's why networking and that middle layer between apps and infrastructure, extremely critical, right? But it has to be invisible to the app developers. Otherwise, we have not done our job. All right. So this this is an interest. I'm, I'm going to use this as a, um, I mean, I mean th this, this analytic question actually very much applies to microservices too. And, and, and what's happening is we're getting, our systems are getting way more complicated. We have this complex network infrastructure with all these analytics and we can look at the flow of between data and we're also adding all of these microservices and little pieces like that. And so um, bringing, so w when you're running it on your, on your laptop and you, can, and you can see the memory it's using and you can, you can run PS a bunch of times and see if the memory is going up. Like that kind of observability is is gone. <laughs> so you have no clue what's going on. And so what we're what we're seeing, um, you know, just in the network layer, we're seeing these analytics tools um, come about that, that's helping to deal with this. We're also seeing this in the microservices and application layer. And there's two there's two interesting projects in the CNCF that I'd like to highlight. It's uh, Prometheus, um, which is which is a metric solution, um, and uh, Open Tracing, which is yeah. a tracing solution, which lets you see how your application interact over um, kind of in a requ request oriented workflow um, and and we we we've, we've started adding uh, Prometheus metrics into Docker and into Container D, and um, and it should be coming into other various CNCF projects as well. And and it's just it's just to help like you it, it makes it so easy that you can just say okay you can finally see oh what are these things doing and then also what are they doing in the aggregate. So right. this is this is so like a super important. ping and really trace route made it up there. Yeah yeah. <laughs> so I, <laughs> I think that this is important because as someone who's worked in developer experience and people exposing APIs to do integrations between maybe different companies or different products, right? There's so many issues in terms of um, when there's a problem, how do you sort out those problems um, across those integrations, and how do you have the right documentation and all of those things to make it happen. And now with a microservices architecture, you're literally creating some of that same interaction within your own application, right? And so the tracing and the metrics becomes incredibly important because otherwise your troubleshooting has just become you know, infinitely complex in some ways. And so um, I think that that is really important. And then there's the security part too, because it can increase like your uh, surface area for attack, because it's like now you have all these many things. And so you have to have all those pieces together to really make it, to make it work. So from a developer perspective, that's something that I'm, I'm hearing different companies say internally, we're having challenges managing the, the reference for all of our 
internal APIs and people are thinking about how do we really make our internal developers efficient working against APIs that exist across the whole company and how do you get the, how do you make sure people build with the right instrumentation to have the tracing in there to make it work and stop guessing yeah right yeah you, so you, you solved that problem for me being doing the shout out for open tracing and um, <laughs> and the CNCF projects which is awesome but just on that security thing like I think that's really important, as you know, as you were saying, the, the attack surface is much, much bigger now because your apps are distributed. You can't just dump them behind your corporate firewall. Um, security was always like you know, the, the, the cousin that no one wanted to talk about anyway, right? It, it always got pushed to the bottom of the budget. So the fact that we were already starting from a, a not particularly great position in the industry with kind of security understanding, and we now have kind of all these new concepts where we can't exactly work out where things are and, and you know when they are and why they are like analytics and kind of you know the industry that needs to kind of build around using that for dynamic security because everything else is dynamic the security cannot be at this point so that's that's an area that we're, we're really going to have to tackle as an industry right and actually interesting that uh, security is sort of one of the inhibitors for many people uh, that wants to uh, move to the cloud and want to embrace cloud native application development, but they are not doing it. So Mayumi, do you have an advice? I know it's a very broad subject, but do you <laughs> have a ad practical advice for developers? I do. What I, should they do? Yeah, so I have a couple of, I, I'm going to take it one way and another way, because um, I've also run cloud security. One is um, definitely from a secure software development lifecycle perspective, if you don't have that practice, build one. Like it's so important that you're building it right all the way through managing it right. Um, and a lot of people forget that it's, it's an IP filtering and it's a networking issue. Oh no, most of that, most of the issues are all in the app tier, right? Layer mm -hmm. seven above. So you've got to absolutely have that uh, practice in there. The second thing is reuse. My gosh, I don't know how many times, Cisco's a big company, how many times I'm having the same conversation from one developer to the other developer around how to harden your code, how to harden your infrastructure. You know, at, at some point, it just makes sense to say, you know what, we're just going to have a hardened Tomcat or, you know, if you want to use Ubuntu or whatever your choice of technology is, have something that's hardened, managed, and ready for you to go, right? Yeah. And, and reuse that because it just, oh gosh, there's so much of that. And I see it not just at Cisco, I see it in other companies too. So I think that's really important to have that discipline, have some people who are gonna manage that in a reusable way um, and, and have that discipline built in. So that's more from like an SDLC perspective. And then when we talk about what tier of security, we gotta talk about certainly there's the classic firewall, IP filtering, that kind of stuff. But you know, to your point, there's, there's a lot of dynamic movements and we got to start looking at some of the classic stuff that I see over and over again, especially if you're using like you know, AWS or some of the other uh, providers is this. Key management, just mm. as important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Credentials, I know, I know you all know this because this is so fundamental, but God knows how many times I actually find these issues. Um, and it is really bad when it's actually out there in the cloud because it's not like it's in your laptop. You know, your dev key, if you're doing development out in the cloud and you happen to absolutely, you know, just absent-mindedly put production key information, credential information, you've just exposed your entire infrastructure. And so um, some of these very basic fundamentals, I, I recommend that there are a few things that we actually have some discipline around and, and some common practice around and reuse around, potentially even tools, so that you don't have to think about it. And, and from a cloud ops, cloud security perspective, the, the thing I think the most important is try to abstract that as much as you can from your code. And you know, try to reuse that as much as you can. You guys want to focus, unless you are infrastructure developers, you want to focus on your features and apps, you know, higher level than that level. And having that, that discipline and capability and expertise in house, or out of house would really help you. That's th those are some practical examples that I have. Uh, yeah. Maybe okay. I'll add a couple of things. So beyond SDLC, right? The AppSec industry itself is really moving yeah. really fast from an innovation. So you got tools for SaaS, DAST, right? You got you got new runtime tools like RASP, right? This all these acronyms are coming through. But at the end of the day, there is a heavy focus of security on the app because that's where you know a lot of you know, especially web web attacks, right? Web apps, right? S facing facing that. So I'd say you know there is there are 
there are new innovations and new tools in that space. Um, we will take care of the network and the infrastructure through the firewalls and all the, all the you know, other things that come in. But app development has a whole separate security. Yeah, right. Definitely. All right. So we talked about the transformation from pets to cattle. Uh, it's we need to think carefully about doing that and to pick the right applications and services that would really bring business value for this rather than do it for technology uh, sake. Yeah. And we have talked about the areas of analytics, security, uh, developer experience. Thank you guys very much and happy transformation. Thank you. Thank you. And stick around because next we've got the uh, giveaways, the end of day giveaways. So we have the Spark Telepresence gear, the Jasper IoT kits, and, um, and we're also going to have some uh, sharing and feedback and some of that. So stick around. We are about to give things away, and you have to be here to win. So. Cool. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. And Paul, you got a mic? All right. So you guys are the heroes because you're still here. <laughs> Woo! OK, so um, we've had two awesome days at DevNet Create. Um, it's, we've had a full agenda, lots of speakers. A lot of people have been hacking, doing mini hacks, looking at different areas. What we wanted to do is uh, this is the first time that we've ever run DevNet Create. Right, so this is a first time developer conference for us. Um, we want your input on what you loved about it, what you hated about it, or what could be improved. Uh, and then also, if you want us to do it again. And then if we do do it again, we will do it again, probably. <laughs> but if we do do it again, what should, like, what should we change? And how, you know, how should we go forward? So we are really open. Um, our whole goal was to provide value to all of you, to really engage in the conversation on IoT and cloud, the changing boundaries of where apps meet infrastructure. You guys have heard it all, but we really want your input. So we are just open. So can you share something you loved, something that could be improved? Should we do it again? And, and how? So we're open for suggestions. Uh, Paul's running. Okay. Yes. Hi. Uh, as somebody who isn't a developer himself, I really appreciated the range of information that was available about the, what you're doing with development and the range of voices that were here in the room. Um, I've been to a lot of Cisco conferences and Cisco, 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 Cisco. And here it was not about that. It was actually about the work that's being done and the way that you see a vision for the future. I really thought that was great. Awesome. Thank you. And then you guys can also let us know if you like agree with the comp, like just do some nods or no ways. Just so, I mean, just to get a feel for what folks think. Yeah, go I ahead. I agree with him. I, I agree with him. <laughs> <laughs> and, and absolutely, we should do it again. Um, from an improvement point of view, uh, from the location, I guess um, some of the workshops were very nearby to each other. Yep. And it was hard to hear the presenter. Kay. So may maybe we could improve on that for the next time. OK. Wonderful. Thank you. Great. Thank you. It's great. Right? You know, I don't want to just sound negative, but it's, it's a fantastic you know, opportunity for us to meet together and go through the DevNet Create. Excellent. Thank you. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Others, I want to hear from everybody. I'd like you to take this into other regions like APAC and get the opinions of those countries. Excellent. All right, cool. And then what we'd have to do is see if we can, you know, uh, and if we look at the success of this conference, um, this was different for us because you're right. When we have the DevNet zone at Cisco Live, it is about Cisco APIs on Cisco platforms and building around it because that's what Cisco Live's about. This was intentionally designed for the community. And all of the, you know, 90% of the content here was from the community. 
So our one question when we go to other regions and we're thinking about it is, you know, will we be able to attract the same quality content that you guys have all generated for us here? So that's a, so we're, we'll think about that going into the other regions. Mm -hmm. Other inputs? Yes. Uh, the conference was really great. Uh, the problem that I had was there were multiple workshops going on and all of them were good. I couldn't select which one to go to. So. <laughs> do people share that? Yeah. yeah. So if we do the workshops, we should ha run them multiple times. Is that like for each session, have it multiple times? Really put the presenters to work? OK. <laughs> what about the, we, did, we had two drafts and three workshops going on. Was that the right amount of choice of things to do or was that too many, too many concurrent tracks, or how did like how did that feel? It's good, yeah. Right amount. Busy, busy, yeah. Well, we like to keep people busy. <laughs> okay, cool. Hey. Yeah, hi, Susie. Uh, great conference. I really had a great time here. I'm over here. Oh, <laughs> yeah, there. Um, yeah, just to piggyback on the on the last guy. Um, so I'm a really technical person, and uh, I like to kind of have more hands-on development stuff and. Uh, I didn't feel like the keynotes in the morning were super down my track for that. Um, so maybe just consider running the workshops and stuff in parallel to the keynotes. So for the people that would really like to spend more time being technical, they can kind of deviate off in their own direction. Other thoughts on that? Yeah. yeah. Mixture? A few? Okay. All right. Great input. Thank you. Yes. Paul, you, you, if you have someone there, you can go there first. Okay, I have, I have him first, actually. <laughs> hey, uh, so first off, thanks for putting this together. It was awesome. Um, you know, just kind of to echo on the, the topic of technical versus non-technical and kind of having some of those things run in parallel. Uh, you know, some of the workshops, you kind of had to make a choice between being in some of the presentations that may have been meaningful and, or going to the workshops as they, since they were at the same time. Uh, and the few that I went to, there were, you know, there's probably one or two that were actually a workshop and something got accomplished in the workshop. And then a few of the other ones were more like product marketing pitches around a product. And I, I kind of felt disappointed that I made a choice to go and listen to that versus something that would have been, you know, meaningful presentation and an expected lecture where someone prepared content. So I, I think, you know, if it's going to be a workshop, it really should be a workshop for the technical folks. And, and that, you know, that's probably one important thing to, to sort of police a little bit better next year. Okay, sounds good. Very important. Thank you. Great feedback. All right, this one over here. Couple over here. Thank you. So, uh, really did enjoy the conference, uh, the workshop especially. One uh, one suggestion that I would give is we had people who were developers and uh, who were coming from operations background, networking background. So maybe some of the content could be uh, geared towards the audiences, right? So if somebody's coming from an operations background, they would also get an opportunity to learn towards uh, the development side. Uh, I mean, I, I understand this was more focused on developers, but I think a lot of operations people that were here as well who could have uh, gotten more information from the development side. Do you guys agree with that? Yeah. Thoughts? Yes. So what? Uh, and actually, we did that. We did that by design because, like at Cisco Live, a lot of it is around the operators and things there. Our DevNet zone at Cisco Live. So we tried to pivot this the other way to be really purely from the app side and DevOps side. Um, but if we need to bring some of it in, then we can bring some of it in. So that's um, good input. Good input and feedback. Great. Um, let's see. So two more. Two more. Oh, and actually, in, in an, and then maybe just one other question is, how should we do it again? When should we do it again? Should we wait a year? You know, do you guys have thoughts on that as well? But let's get these comments first. Go ahead. Hey, hi. Yeah. Um, well, several things from several things that everybody commented on. I do believe that it should be organized a little bit differently because there's not time for one to do everything one wants to do during two days. But evidently, putting together something like this is really hard, and the longer it is, the harder it is to organize. So um, two things, perhaps. One, keep as much as possible of the material that we see here, and the talks and the labs and everything available going on so we can come back to it 
and some of the talks I wanted to hear, I can then watch online. That yes. helps a lot. It's not the same as being in the room, but then you can set up your track a lot better. And um, going back to the labs, same thing with the labs as with the workshops. Um, some, some of the instructions were not perfect. That happens. There was actually something that broke. And they changed something on, on one of the sites that were used, and well, that happens. Uh, but still, I felt that they didn't have enough time to go and sit down and do the labs because I actually wanted to go to all the talks. So perhaps something around there, I don't know, maybe extending it half a day, day more just for labs or something like that. I don't know. Would you guys want us to make it three days? I would. Absolutely. Because I yeah. know it's just a lot of investment in your time. So. But it's worth it. That's the thing. Why do you think it's worth it? It's worth it because you learn new things and you connect to the people. And that's great. Just those two okay. things are great. A lot of um, conferences I've been to recently do uh, the first day of only workshops. So it's a whole workshop day, and then you move into the, the conference track. Do you guys feel like that's a format that you might be interested in? Yeah. Nods? Yeah, so like a pure, a dedicated workshop day, and then moving into the conference. That's good. And to oh. your point, all of our videos are going to be available online, all the slides. The labs are always there, and the mini hacks will be there too. So you, you definitely can continue after the event. Yep. So just to follow up on your point of you know what's the value. So having come you know being an infrastructure guy for 20 plus years, you know for Cisco's benefit, I think you have to keep putting this on, because it's reaching out to the developer community as you shift, as, as the as the industry shifts and you're moving with it, um, bringing the developers on board as an infrastructure company, and then the flip side is getting the infrastructure guys to come on board with. Here's what's going on from an application standpoint and why we really need to break down, say, the silos between development and infrastructure. You know, just as the panel was discussing, right, how do we get integrated security from the plumbing all the way through the application and make sure that everybody's on board? So I think you, moving forward, it has to be done. Um, do you guys agree with that? Yeah. yeah. Oh, OK. Awesome. Right. Awesome. Did, there's that one right here. <laughs> um, so this is a great event. Um, if you're thinking about doing more, maybe doing uh, something like an East Coast one and then maybe a Midwest one, so that way you can get more coverage, because I notice most of the attendees here are from uh, West Coast primarily, um, so that way you get a little bit more uh, broader audience. Do you guys want a DevNet Create Tour? <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, when should we do the next thing? Next week? <laughs> I think my team's going to kill me. <laughs> hey, guys, we're doing it next week. <laughs> no, go ahead. Just like, like do, we want, do we want any ongoing communication between now and the next one? Like, do you guys want any community formation? By the way, I know that we talked about project opportunity, and people wanted to continue on that. If you go to http slash colon slash slash um, cs.co, Slash, sis, uh, slash opportunity, uh, cs.co slash opportunity. You can sit there and put your name, email address, and then we'll contact you guys next about how to do some projects, because we're looking at continuing around that and creating some projects uh, of the format that Drew and uh, Radhika had talked about this morning. Um, but do you want ongoing, like how could we continue the conversation between now and the next time we do this, whether it's six months or a year from now? Any thoughts? Do you guys want to somehow continue interacting as a community between then, or do you just want to wait till the next event? What if we, what if we did, what if we offered some of the, the workshops <coughs> and the talks again as online webinars that you could join? So you could say, we're going to rerun the Node Red workshop, and you can join it online, or things like that. Yeah? Is that a good? OK. Cool. Yeah. cool. Good. Great. And then just quickly yell out, if you have like one word to describe what you think about or, you know, how DevNet Create felt to you or what you thought you would describe it. Awesome. awesome. Yeah. Learn. Learn. Inclusive. Yeah. Diverse. Yeah. Lego. Yeah. Encouraging. Talk about inclusive. Um, I'm a beginner right now. Hopefully by next year I won't be. But um, I just felt that the staff and everyone that I met was just really eager to you know, help catch me up to speed, and the content was mostly 
very digest digestible. Um, if I, you know, had to slide in one maybe suggestion is having an indication of like, is there a workshop that's great for people who are just getting started, or is there, you know, a speak, the, you know, a presentation that would be great for that. Cool. Thank you. And uh, I'm going to take that as a compliment and thank my team and thank all of you for being welcoming to each other because we are hoping this is a community and we actually tried to be welcoming, <laughs> if I can say it. So I'm glad that you felt it. Thank you. Great. Okay. Um, on to the next thing. So what we're going to do, uh, Mandy, so should we start our raffle? Yes. Oh, wait, but before the raffles. Uh, we're going to do the raffle like we did yesterday. We've got the Spark gear that we're giving out and the Jasper IoT kits. But I want to show you what the Jasper IoT kit is and what you can build with it before we give it out. So, Jock Reed, come to the stage. He is bringing uh, one of the kits. And is, is Casey Bleeker still here? He's not here. Oh, OK. That's <coughs> OK. All right, so. Um, OK. <laughs> so I think you're going to need these mics, um, the podium mics, if we can have that, um, and some power, right? Oh, yeah. Are Did, you still have a power strip up here? Though, yep, it's right here. Do the podium mics work? Are they had an extension yeah. cord? They're on. He's good. All right. Okay. Yeah, so I can I can talk over it while you're plugging in. So this has been one of the mini hacks that's been going on back there, and it uses um, the Jasper IoT kit, which basically gives you a way to connect your IoT device and um, wirelessly. And it has the water sensor. You can dunk it in the water, and then it sends you a notification in Spark. We didn't want to bring water on the stage because I'm too klutzy, so we're going to be using um, <laughs> We're going to be using a, a button that we will push that would simulate the, the water signal. But in the giveaway that we'll give out, you'll actually get this kit with all the pieces so you could build this project at home or build other projects on top of it. So it's something you can take home and, and play with. <coughs> yeah. Let me find, I got to find the room real quick. Hang on. <laughs> and we get to read all of Jock's messages. <laughs> I hope they're. <laughs> I hope I didn't drop any f bombs in there. <laughs> okay. So what's in the kit, Jock? Give us the rundown of what is in the actual kit. What are all those pieces? It's messaging right now. Good. Okay. Um, <laughs> so everything that's in the kit, everything you get in there, you don't get the. Pick it up. Water so you're by the mic. Or, yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Or oh, sorry. It doesn't extend all the way up here. So um, in the IoT kit that we're giving away, everything with the exception of the sensor, the water sensor, you don't get the water sensor. That's extra. You have to get that yourself. But you get the SD card, the SIM card, which is powered by Jasper. Yeah. Um, so you can auto provision that. It's great. And um, you get the cellular hat, which is the top part, and then the microcontroller, which is the bottom. And then you get the two antennas for the cellular connectivity. Cool. All right. So, yeah, and that's. Okay. Tell us about the demo. Yeah. So, basically, with instead of using the uh, um, the water sensor, just like you said, we're, we're using a touch sensor, and so that way, what what happens is, is when this is touched and this is read, it sends a, um, a some data to the uh, to the AT and T um, M2X platform, and then that's forwarded to um, built I.O. and then that's forwarded to Spark. And so a lot of you did that and so this is kind of a, um, a modified use case. And then this also kind of shows that you can use, you don't just have to use a water sensor, you can use anything. And so one of the things I'll even say about the use case that was on the mini hack is that that's an actual use case. So we actually have some people that have been talking to us and they were, they were wanting to deploy um, some sensors on a farm to measure moisture and they were like well we don't want to do Wi-Fi because we're worried about security so we think we're gonna go wired because it's it's gonna be too hard for us to provision um, the, ja the the SIM cards and so then they found they started finding out about Jasper and they started talking to us about it and that's actually a good use case for them and so now they can use that to um, auto deploy their you know cellular connected devices and it leaves uh, it leaves them with ha having a lot of uh, extra overhead to be able to manage that. Cool. So yeah. All right. That's great. Okay. So we're going to do the giveaway now. That's yeah. good. Yeah. All 
All right. Thank you, Josh. So, um, and if you we if you want to talk, if you get a kit and you want the instructions that go with the mini hack, we can connect that up for you. Yeah. And a lot of them are online that we can point you to as well. All right. So now, get out your cell phones. Go to https colon slash slash raffle.devnetcreate.io and bring it up. And here we go. Yep. So this is where you want to head to. How many of you were here last night when we gave away prizes? Who was yeah. not here? Was anybody not here last night? Okay. All okay. Right. Some new so. possible winners. All right. So you're going to go to this page. You will see a get started. Click get started. Uh, you will log in to DevNet so we know who you are. Um, you can use any of your social logins or your Spark login or your Cisco login. And then you will be asked to enter a number between 1 and 50. So enter your number, and then we will do a, a virtual drawing using API calls, of course, to, um, to figure out who got the closest or who got the exact number that we will choose. We will randomly generate a number that we're matching against. So pick your number. And give me some um, visual confirmation when everybody is, when you've got your number in. Yeah, good. OK. Who is still entering their number? Couple here and there. OK. You got to be quick. <laughs> <laughs> so you should see your number come up. We had someone who did not read the instructions and picked something way beyond 50 yesterday. Uh, even now. <laughs> OK. Even now. <laughs> oh, yeah, we got one round. OK. So, um, Oh, yep. <laughs> so that's fantastic. OK, keep going. Who needs more time? Are we good? OK, a couple more, a couple more. All right. What else? OK, going. All right. Who needs more time still? One more second. Yep, yep. All right, it's getting close. I'm seeing less hands. That's good. That's good. All right. April, do you have the number? Okay. Okay. No, no. I think we got like two more. I see two more hands out there. We'll give everybody a chance to get in, and we're good. Okay, let's do it. Generate the random number. Okay. So we're gonna do the Jasper kits first. So let's pick a number and see who our first Jasper kit winner is. It's 16. 16. Oh, wow, we've got three. Awesome. So come on up if you are one of these three people, and we will give you your Jasper kit. Congratulations. Yeah. You can have a bottle opener, too. Here comes your kit. All right. Great. 16 was a lucky number. Where's the third? Oh, they're not here? How are they not? Oh, is you? Oh, you can't win. So we need, we'll do another drawing. OK. Ali, OK. OK. 34. Who is it? Oh, no. 31. Wow, that was quick. Anybody? 31. <laughs> nope. Oh, nope. Yeah. Again? I like where it's going. <laughs> 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 Try it again? Anybody? Nobody? 39? Oh, oh, right. Come on up. Get your kits. All right. Congratulations. Excellent. Only see one. Where's the other person? All right. Congratulations. All right. Congratulations. All right. And we have one more. Oh, that was my high school calculus teacher's favorite number. He used it in all examples. Uh, Woo! Mark. Mark? Nope. Keep going. Okay. All right. Next. <laughs> oh. Twenty. Anybody twenty? Oh. oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> it was like group think. They saw the numbers and chose the same. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Andreas? Andreas, you're here? 
We got a winner, yeah, all right, fantastic. Got a bottle opener? Yeah, but you have one? No. You can have another, yeah. Congratulations, yeah, thank you. Okay, and now we've got the spark gear. All right. It's the SX-10. There goes, the SX-10. Conferencing unit. One. Number one. Number one, no way. What are the chances? Anybody pick one? You did? Yes. Oh! Let's see it. You gotta prove it. <laughs> there you go. Oh, all right. Congratulations. Nice. All right, you wanna say like a... Excellent. Thank you, guys. Um, so, fantastic. Thank you all once again. Um, DevNet Create was, you know, our hopes that we would be able to create a community and kind of provide something of value so that we can do it again. Uh, it sounds like the feedback is that we should continue. So again, I want to thank all of you because the content came from all of you. Um, the value and the interactions and everything, you know, those who presented papers officially or those who even were just participating, it's awesome. So I just want to thank you. Uh, and we will continue to provide value. Uh, thanks to all of our teams, who, members who have been organizing and working on this for months um, to get this all together. So let me just thank all of you guys. Um, thanks to our partners, GPJ, audio, video, our crew over here, the venue staff. Thank you all for pulling off such an awesome event. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Okay, and then finally, once again, thanks to all of you. We have beer for you out there, so please uh, hang out with us and continue. Thanks yep, a lot, thank everybody. You. Take care. Thanks. Thank you.